What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. It's finals week. Merry Chipmas to all of you that are in the fantasy playoffs, in the fantasy finals this week. As always, we are going through the uh, quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, and tight ends that you need to be starting, sitting, flexing, all that kind of stuff. Um, before I get into this, um, there are timestamps in the description. If you guys want to know about a specific game, you can just go ahead and skip to that game. You don't have to hear me talk about everything else. We're going to hit the intro, but before we do that, if you guys receive any value at this point in the video, at any point in the video, pause the video, go down to the bottom, hit the like button. Looks like this helps us out tremendously. Also leave any of your comments, any of your start sick questions for the championship week. Maybe we helped you get to the championship. You want to show some appreciation. All that kind of stuff will help us out and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Um, now, without further ado, guys, let's get into the intro. Okay, so as always, we split this into two videos. I will be going through the first seven games according to NFL.com schedule in this one. Um, the reason I'm going through the first seven and not eight and eight is because I wanted to do a pace breakdown of the slate. I normally just go through the fastest pace games, but uh, because this is championship week, we want to know everything about this slate of games. And as you can see on the screen right now, you'll see fastest pace games of the week of week 16. So right now, the Buccaneers at Lions is the fastest pace game of the week. It also has the highest over under, I believe. On the slate, Eagles at Cowboys, second fastest pace game. Falcons at Chiefs also has one of the higher over-unders on the week. I think these are the, the, the three games right here that you are attacking. And when I say attacking, I mean, if you're caught between a start-sit decision and you have, I don't know, Amari Cooper versus someone else, the fact that this game is supposed to be faster pace and uh, potentially uh, higher scoring as a result uh, lends itself to um, you making that decision and using that as a tiebreaker. Uh, next slowest pace games of the week. So the exact opposite of this, you should use this as a tiebreaker on the other side of things. Vikings at Saints, very slow pace game there. Dolphins at Raiders, Browns at Jets, Rams uh, at Seahawks. All three, all four of those games are supposed to be slower pace. Doesn't mean there necessarily can't be high scoring in this game in, in these games, but the amount of offensive plays run is expected to be low compared to the games that I just talked about. And then Lastly, we have the most one-sided pace games. And what this means is that one team runs plays quickly and one team does not run te uh, plays quickly. So what this could mean is that the Cardinals, the Washington football team, and the Titans, who are the one-sided part of it, are likely to dominate time of possession and vice versa. They're likely to uh, run more offensive plays than the other team, which should not only lead you to um, believe that Cardinals players might have good games. It could also lead you to believe that 49ers players might not have as good of games because if the Cardinals are running an a lot of offensive plays, it means the 49ers offense isn't on the field and Brandon Ayuk and Jeff Wilson and whoever else you'd be starting in this game might not have as many uh, plays run and targets as a result. So um, to the first game that we have here on the slate, Christmas day football. Uh, I don't think this has ever happened before that we've had, uh, an NFL game on every single week of the uh, of the of the week because we had a Wednesday game, a Tuesday game, all that kind of stuff, and now we have a Friday game because Christmas Day is on a Friday. We have the Vikings at Saints, um, and as always, guys, I talked about it last week, but my parameters because this is Championship Week have shrunk. So normally, I talk about um, top twenty-ish quarterbacks. This week, a start means they're QB fifteen or better in my rankings. Wide receiver thirty or better for wide receivers. Uh, running back twenty-four or better for running backs. And tight end 15 are better for tight end. So the parameters have shrunk and, and um, no shock because there's only two teams left likely in your, uh, in your leagues as it stands. So you should um, have a pretty good team if you made the championship. So to the quarterback position in this game, with those parameters in mind, that makes both quarterbacks in this game a sit for me. As I mentioned, the, the slowest pace game of the slate, Breeze and Kirk Cousins are QB 16, or sorry, QB 18 and QB 19 for me in my rankings. Um, there are mul there are multiple multiple touchdown vultures between uh, each quarterback in this game. We have Dalvin Cook potentially taking away uh, touchdowns from Kirk Cousins. We have Alvin Kamara and Taysom Hill and uh, Latavius Murray taking away touchdowns from Drew Brees in this game. So there's a chance that these guys are just efficient, like solid NFL quarterbacks, not necessarily uh, fantasy production. So I would stay away from these guys. I think there are better options that you can uh, start this week. Uh, neither of these neither of these guys have been bad for fantasy reasons, but each matchup is kind of meh and uh, there are better options available. So to the running back position in this game, we have Alvin Kamara and Dalvin cook, two guys that I highly doubt you'd be sitting. 
This is, this is basically where my matchup begins this week. Uh, as an Alvin Kamara owner, you're expecting a big game out of your stud running back and hopefully Taysom Hill can screw off on the goal line because that was really annoying last week. Um, so Kamara can attack the defense, allowing the seventh most fantasy points to the running back position over the past five games and a defense allowing nearly five yards per carry over that stretch as well. As you can see on the screen, this is my matchup. This is the opponent I'm going to be playing. Unfortunately for me, I lost Clyde Edwards Hilaire last week and I lost Ronald Jones as it, it looks like this week. So I have to start T Higgins in my flex spot and hopefully Tony Pollard is going to remain the starting running back because if he's not, I'm going to be in some serious trouble and I have to start T Higgins and DJ Chark as my flexes, which I really don't want to be doing in the fantasy, uh, in the fantasy championship. So uh, Dalvin Cook on the other side of things is in for another tough matchup this week. Probably doesn't really make much of a difference for Dalvin Cook because we saw him put up a great game against Chicago who should have been a tough matchup for him. And we saw Miles Sanders a couple of weeks ago get it done against this defense. So I think Dalvin Cook can do the same thing that Miles Sanders can do. Uh, to the wide receiver position in this game, we have Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. I would sit all of the New Orleans Saints wide receivers because Michael Thomas is out for this game, as we already know. Is there going to be a productive Saints receiver in this game? Probably, but you won't be able to guess who it is. And it's too risky in your fantasy championship to try and do that. Um, Jefferson and Thielen, on the other hand, we, we know what we're getting out of these guys. We've had a 15 game sample size to see that. They should be in for a solid day. We, we've seen a changing of the guard uh, over the last couple of weeks for Thielen and Jefferson. Jefferson is now receiving way more volume than Adam Thielen has been, uh, receiving 10 plus targets in four of his last six games. Justin Jefferson, he has become the safer play, which is not something I thought I would say earlier in the season. Uh, with Thielen low-key becoming like a touchdown or bus guy recently because he, he's generally, most of his fantasy production has come in the red zone. It has not come off of a high volume role like he had last year and previous years when Stefan Diggs was there. So Justin Jefferson is definitely a safer start in this one. He has Marshawn Lattimore, according to this, in coverage. I'm not exactly sure um, if they're going to shadow Adam Thielen with uh, Marshawn Lattimore, but we th we saw earlier in the season that Jair Alexander actually shadowed Justin Jefferson and Ad instead of Adam Thielen like we initially anticipated. So I think Justin Jefferson has been being treated as the number one receiver there for a while now by NFL defenses. And if they use Lattimore as a shadow, which I'm not necessarily sure that they will, He's going to be on Justin Jefferson and Lattimore in it. Like Lattimore and Jenkins have been okay this season, but they're not nearly as, uh, as good as Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson has been, have been playing. So I think both of those guys are in for pretty solid days to the tight end position in this game. We have both guys teetering on streamable range with Drew Brees back. Jared cook becomes a touchdown or bust type of tight end and Irv Smith without Kyle Rudolph in the lineup is a big play threat. So all, both of these guys are usable. Neither of them are a great option, but both are definitely usable in this game. All right, to the Saturday three stack that we have. And in Canada, we call it Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. So I'm not sure if it's even called anything in the United States, but it's Boxing Day football for us. And I would have actually been at this game, which is really unfortunate for me. Um, but, you know, COVID had to happen. So Buccaneers at Lions. You start Tom Brady with absolute confidence in this game and you stream Matthew Stafford. The reason you start Tom Brady with absolute confidence, even though he had a bit of a shaky start last week, he should be an obvious start in this game because he did well in basically only a half of football against Atlanta, who was a very much improving defense without his starting left tackle last week. So he has performed significantly better in good matchups, favorable matchups, posting 27 uh, PPR points per game against non-top 10 pass defenses. And I can assure you the Lions are not only not a top 10 pass defense, they are the furthest thing from it. Um, and then he's scoring about 19 points per game against bad matchups, which is about what Atlanta was last week, according to their recent play. Not only is this a top 10 defense, or sorry, is this not a top 10 defense? This is a defense that is currently allowing 28.4 fantasy points per game over the last five weeks to the quarterback position. That is only behind Tom Brady's own defense that he practices against in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. On the flip side, I'm actually comfortable using Stafford because of the way that Tampa Bay is uh, playing on defense lately. As you can see, they're allowing more points than the Lions are to opposing quarterbacks. They are talented enough to turn it on at any point and absolutely mollywop the Lions. And just and you saw it in the second half. Matt Ryan didn't get a lot going in the second half because Devin White and Levante David and those, those guys up front were making it so tough on him. That is very possible to happen in this game, but they just have not been able to do that for four quarters. And that's generally enough for quarterbacks on the other side of the ball to perform for fantasy. So if if they come out and get out to a slow start like they have been the past couple of weeks, there's a good chance that Matt uh, Stafford is going to be viable for fantasy. Uh, to the running back position, we have Leonard Fournette, presumably the starter for this week, and um, DeAndre Swift on the other side of things. Bruce Arians was quoted as saying Rojo is basically doubtful, referring to both his COVID situation and his fingers. So basically what he said was 
Um, they don't really know what to expect because they haven't seen him in practice referring to his finger and they don't know when they're going to get him in practice because of the COVID issue. So it's kind of a double-edged sword right now. We, we, I would anticipate if Rojo gets back on the field uh, today's Wednesday, I'm not exactly sure if he got back on the field today. I don't think he did. Otherwise I would have seen that he was activated off the COVID list, but if he doesn't get back on the field by tomorrow being Thursday, um, I, I wouldn't expect him to play in this game. And if he is out, Leonard Fournette is in a great matchup because not only are the lines bad against the pass, they're bad against the run too. And very bad against both. So I think he's a borderline top 20 option. Leonard Fournette, I currently have him at RB19. Uh, and he has a great shot at, at scoring a, a rushing touchdown in this game. And we saw even last week in a bad matchup, he scored two rushing touchdowns in that game, which was definitely enough to um, perform well for fantasy. And, and Jared Small tweeted out his usage last week with Rojo out of the lineup. He saw 66% of the snaps, which is feature back usage, 44% of the routes, which is much more than Leonard, or uh, which is much more than Leonard Fournette probably deserves. Um, 14 out of the 16 running back carries and five of the nine running back targets. If, you, if he's getting an 18, uh, 19, 20 opportunity type of uh, output in this game, he's going to perform because the Lions defense is just, is just straight up awful. Um, DeAndre Swift, on the other hand, is in a bad matchup, obviously. We know at this point, it's been a long time coming that the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have allowed a lot of fantasy production to the running back position. They just don't do it. But DeAndre Swift's week 15 usage, along with his usage, pretty much any non-concussion affected game that he's uh, been in, has been 64% of the snaps last week, 56% of the routes, 15 of the 21 running back carries and five of five running back targets. That is feature workhorse volume. And if, I don't know, Nick Chubb was playing against Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you wouldn't be sitting him because he gets feature workhorse volume, which is exactly what DeAndre Swift is getting. He's a feature back set to receive a lot of receiving work and goal line touches, which those two things alone should be enough to keep him at least in that top 12 range against a, a horrible matchup on the ground. I don't expect him to get much going on the ground, but through the air, and on the goal line is where he's going to make his money. So don't be sitting DeAndre Swift just because it's a bad matchup. Uh, to the wide receiver position in this game, all three of the Buccaneers wide receivers are startable, and Marvin Jones is actually my start of the week at the uh, wide receiver position. Uh, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Antonio Brown. Those are the order that I would start the Tampa Bay wide receivers. The Lions are the easiest matchup uh, possible, given that they rank only behind Tampa Bay's defense against the wide receiver position in terms of fantasy points per game. And that's obviously void a little bit by Tyree kills monster game, but it is still valid. All uh, receivers outside of the Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen duo over the last five games have just had their way with this defense. The secondary is not playing as well as it used to be. Um, Jamel Dean's banged up. Carlton Davis banged up. Sean Murphy bunting is just not very good. Um, as you can see, um, but for the uh, Buccaneers receivers, we could see Chris Godwin against Justin Coleman in the slot is a great matchup for him. Antonio Brown against the more Amani or on the outside. And uh, Mike Evans against Mike Ford on the outside. Like all three of these guys have great matchups. And I, this is a game where I expect them to throw the ball quite a bit. As I've mentioned that we don't have Ronald Jones in this game. I, like Leonard Fournette is a fine backup running back, fine um, guy who can handle a workload, but he's not going to be as effective on the ground as Ronald Jones uh, would have been. So I expect them could, they're going to need to move the ball through the air. And I think all three of these guys are able to be started for that reason with Mike Evans being inside my top 12, because I think he has a good shot at a big play in this one. Uh, Marvin Jones, on the other hand, he is my start of the week. He has been an absolute volume hog the past six weeks, commanding double-digit targets in four of six games, which is basically the same thing that Justin Jefferson has been doing. If Carlton Davis plays, which is in doubt for sure, because he did pull his groin last week, and uh, Bruce Arians basically said he's, he's progressing in practice, but we, we don't exactly know what his status is going to be going into this game. I'd imagine he's probably going to be questionable, and he either plays or he doesn't, maybe a true 50-50 type decision. However, last week we saw even with Carlton Davis as a shadow, as soon as Calvin Ridley was off of Carlton Davis in coverage, because a shadow coverage matchup, usually you're only on the guy 60, 80% of the routes. As soon as Calvin Ridley was off Carlton Davis, he did damage against Sean Murphy bunting. And he, he will get the ball, Marvin Jones, if that is the case. And again, even more so if, uh, if Carlton Davis doesn't play in this game, Marvin Jones is even that much more upgraded. So he's a guy I have in wide receiver two range, which I think is very fair considering the volume that he's been seeing. And uh, if you're in, if you're playing DFS or whatever, you can see the matchups on the screen right now. Danny Amendola against Sean Murphy Bunting in the slot. I don't hate Danny Amendola as a low key DFS play. If you're going to be playing the uh, the Saturday slate of DFS, I think Danny Amendola is a smash, um, cheap kind of budget play in that uh, type of situation because he's probably going to see some volume against the worst corner on this team by far. Uh, to the tight end position, we know uh, we kind of know what we're getting out of these two guys: T.J. Hawkinson and Rob Gronkowski. They both should be top eight starts at the position. I know TJ Hawkinson was not great last week. 
uh, Rob Gronkowski ditto, to be honest. But given the scoring potential of this game, there's a good chance that both of these guys could catch touchdowns. So I think either both of them are in your lineup, no, no matter what. Um, unless you have someone like, I don't know, unless you have Noah Fant, maybe I'd start over uh, a guy like Rob Gronkowski. But I think even then, th- this matchup is just way too good for him. All right, to the next game we have here. We have the 49ers at Cardinals. As I mentioned, this is going to be one of the more lopsided games in terms of how many plays the opposing team is going to run. I probably expect this to be kind of lopsided in terms of the score as well, just given the fact that the Cardinals are pretty much at full strength, at full health. And the 49ers, as they've been all season, they're just completely banged up. They don't have Nick Mullins even, let alone Jimmy Garoppolo for this game. They're probably going to be starting C.J. Beathard. Um, But either way, to the quarterback position in this game, we have Kyler Murray, obviously a start. And C.J. Beathard, obviously a sit. Last week was a week that I, we encouraged you, both me and Danny, encouraged you to trust Kyler Murray because we did get a number of questions being like, Yo, should I play Kyler Murray or should I play Jalen Hurts or should I play like some of these fringe options? And obviously, if you played Jalen Hurts, it worked out well for you. But given the range of outcomes, I said to start Kyler Murray because I think he was much safer. Um, the matchup was substantially easier last week than it was in previous weeks against the Eagles defense. This week, Kyler Murray definitely has a tougher matchup against the San Francisco 49ers. However, the lack of the starting quarterback uh, in this game along on the other side of the ball, along with the massive dichotomy, as I mentioned, between the two paces of the team, uh, of the two teams, lead me to believe that Kyler Murray and the Cardinals will have a lot of plays run in this game. And that means a lot of rush attempts for Kyler Murray, a lot of pass attempts for Kyler Murray, and a lot of fantasy production for Kyler Murray. So I expect, as I mentioned, the Cardinals to dominate the time of possession in this game. And that means good things for Kyler Murray and DeAndre Hopkins and anyone else that you would be starting on this offense. Um, to the quarterback position on the uh, 49er side of things, we have some news relating to it. We have Jimmy Garoppolo was actually, uh, actually activated off of IR on Tuesday, which was yesterday. I'm not sure that means anything towards him, like potentially trying to start this game or anything like that. I think he's just returning to practice. I'm not exactly sure why they would designate him to return from IR if they didn't want him to play though because it's week 16, they're not going to make the playoffs. I, I think he's an upgrade over CJ Beathard. If he does start, I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, for IU and company, I think he is an upgrade if he, he somehow does see the field, but I do expect it to be CJ Beathard. And I, I think um, IU is, is pretty safe regardless. Uh, to the running back position in this game, we have Jeff Wilson and Kenyon Drake. Both of them are flex starters for me, uh, both kind of on that fringe RB2 range, like low end RB2. Uh, Jeff Wilson uh, last week saw 20 opportunities with Raheem Mostert leaving that game early. Plus, we know that Jeff Wilson, even if Raheem Mostert was there, has a shot at a touchdown with all the goal line work that he's been seeing. He's pretty much been the goal line back, even in games where he was like the fourth string running back, he's been their goal line back. So none of the other guys, um, Jarek McKinnon and Tevin Coleman, got much run outside of Wilson, even when uh, Raheem Mostert went down. So I would stick just with... uh, Jeff Wilson, uh, as far as the running backs are concerned in this game for the San Francisco 49ers, I have him at back end RB2 range. I think he's a pretty uh, solid start for me. Kenyon Drake, on the other hand, was inexplicably phased out last week. I really don't know why he didn't get that much volume. He wasn't very effective on that volume, so that's probably a good reason why. But I think we have a big enough sample size of Kenyon Drake's uh, kind of career so far in Arizona of him being the primary ball carrier. And prior to last game, he had scored five touchdowns in his previous four games. So I think he's around that four net um, Mike Davis type range for me because both of those guys also need touchdowns to be effective as well. I think Kenyon Drake is around my RB 20 ish. I think if I was given a choice in this game, I would probably start Kenyon Drake over Jeff Wilson, just given the fact that I expect the, the game to be kind of lopsided. But I think Je- you could make an argument that Jeff Wilson could be a starter over Kenyon Drake, just given the fact that his offense is probably likely to be more uh, efficient on the ground because it's an easier matchup for him and Jeff Wilson is has a bit more of a safer role which is kind of weird to say given the fact that it's Kyle Shanahan's offense nonetheless to the wide receiver position in this game we have the two studs Brandon Ayuk and DeAndre Hopkins Brandon Ayuk is basically what you wanted CD Lamb to be uh, earlier on in the season when we saw CD Lamb with Dak Prescott he was getting like just massive target totals whatever word you want to use to describe Brandon Ayuk stud superstar whatever it is he is excellent 10, 14, 9, 16, and 13 targets. Those are the the target totals of his last five games. Nine or more targets in all five and no less than 73 yards with a number of 100-yard games. He also scored four touchdowns in five of the the games that he played um, previously. So he sees Drake Kirkpatrick in coverage and a Cardinals defense that is just overall just not good against receivers. They, They are allowing about league average production to the wide receiver position. And I think Brandon Ayuk, given the fact that he's been such a target hog since Debo Samuel uh, has been out, and honestly, since just Brandon Ayuk's come into his own in the NFL, 
I think he's someone that you're very much trusting as a top 12 receiver, in my opinion. Uh, DeAndre Hawkins, on the other hand, well, not on the other hand, he's also someone you're definitely trusting. He's uh, expected to see Akella Witherspoon in coverage. I don't think that's going to end well for him. Uh, the Cardinals will do their best to have Hopkins away from Richard Sherman as much as possible. And um, for those of you who don't know, Richard Sherman is not a shadow corner. He has not shadowed once this entire season. And even when Jason Verrett has shadowed, he has not shadowed number one receiver. So it's a little bit weird um, why they would use Jason Verrett like that. I think it should be a routine day at the office for DeAndre Hopkins, especially, but for both of these guys, they're both in my top 12. I expect both of them to be uh, relatively safe from a volume uh, projection kind of standpoint. Ayuk's only real concern is the fact that they might not have the ball very much uh, to the tight end position in this game. Jordan Reed, I would, I would say he's a sit while he's not an awful option. He is outside of my top 15, which I said are the parameters for the start sit uh, decisions this week. Reed's targets haven't been really consistent uh, with or without Samuel in the lineup. So he's just someone I'd rather uh, play other options than Jordan Reed, but I do think he is usable if you're in a pinch. Uh, maybe you lost uh, Eric Ebron last week and somehow still won your game. That couldn't have been me. I actually, needed four points out of Eric Ebron and he did not come through uh, for me, unfortunately. So I did not make the championship in that league, but either way, uh, if you have Eric Ebron or someone that maybe got injured, Mike Kosicki or something like that, I think Jordan Reed is a usable option. I, I don't think he's a great option, but I think you could use him. All right. Closing out the Friday or sorry, the Saturday three stack of games that we have here for uh, boxing day for us Canadians dolphins at Raiders will be the night game for Saturday night. At the quarterback position, we have Tua and Mariota. Both of them are guys I'm really not willing to start. Tua is currently my QB 17, so he is just outside of that range. I said he'd be comfortable starting a quarterback in. He's been solid against the against tough matchups in the past couple of weeks with limited weapons at that. But if he gets some of them back, I may move him up a little bit. Either way, though, I'd rather start someone like Jared Goff against the Seahawks, Matthew Stafford against the Bucks, Mitch Trubisky against Jacksonville, or Baker Mayfield against the Jets. I, I just think those guys are probably better options, probably safer options. And they have better weapons around them. So they're, that generally makes their floor a bit higher. So I, I just don't want to be trusting Tua and especially Mariota. I know Mariota is, is strictly kind of like this. I think he's a super flex pickup. If you have him in a super flex league, I think you could definitely start him in that. Or if you had Derek Carr and, and you, you need a desperation play, I suppose he's not much worse of an option than Derek Carr. But he is facing a horrid matchup through the air. He may present some value on the ground for you. As we saw against the Chargers, he was definitely running the ball. But as I mentioned, unless you have Derek Carr, or something in a uh, super flex. I just don't think you can trust a guy like Marcus Mariota in your championship game because Mariota, while he did play well, is we, we pretty much know what Marcus Mariota is at this point in his career. And he has been a guy that's consistently disappointed us for fantasy. So I just stay away from him. I wouldn't get, I think it's just a little too cute to start him in anything other than a super flex league uh, to the running back position in this game. We have Josh Jacobs and whoever the starting running back for the Miami dolphins is I'll start with Jacobs because he's very simple he rewarded fantasy managers last week after kind of trolling them the week before he had two touchdowns against one of the worst run defenses in terms of DVOA last week. So um, he definitely had a pretty easy matchup from that perspective. This week is definitely a tougher matchup given the fact that his offense may struggle to move the ball through the air. Not only that, but this offense is all, or this defense, the Dolphins defense have been a bottom five matchup in terms of fantasy points allowed to the running back position over the past five games. So Josh Jacobs is a guy that you definitely are starting because he gets the volume and, and he has a good chance at a touchdown every given week, gets some receiving volume as well, but he is not a guy that I'm going to be ranking overly high compared to consensus. I believe consensus has him at nine. I think I have him at like 12 or something like that. Okay. So on the other hand, Miles Gaskin, as I'm recording this, it just came out that he's been activated off the reserve COVID list. So Miles Gaskin should be set to return in this game, should be back to his normal workload. I know Salvin Ahmed did really well in his, in his uh, absence. He had a hundred yard game and a touchdown, but Miles Gaskin, anytime he's been on the field has been the workhorse back. And we haven't exactly seen both of them on the field recently. Maybe they do split touches, but I think Miles Gaskin is a guy you can trust as a back end RB2. I would rank him higher based on his usage, but the whole Salvin Ahmed part of it makes it a little bit um, kind of murky thinking that they might use Ahmed more than they have been because he has played well. Um, but either way, Gaskin is a guy that I think is in that Le'Veon Bell type of territory. I think I would rather start Le'Veon Bell slightly, but it is, is definitely close between guys like that to the wide receiver position in this game. All of them are sits. Don't start a single one under no circumstances. Should Lynn Bowden be played? Should Devonte Parker be played? If he even suits up for this game, should Nelson Aguilar be played? Should Henry Ruggs, if he suits up for this one, be played or Hunter Renfro be played? If you absolutely must play a receiver from this game, it would probably be Nelson Aguilar, but he sees Xavier Howard in coverage. And that will not be an easy matchup for him. So I would avoid all the receivers in this game. 
especially Devontae Parker, if he somehow manages to get on the field, he probably will disappoint you in this game because he has not been very good with Tua. He's coming off a multi-week injury. Just I would not, I would not mess with any receivers in this game. To the tight end position, we have Darren Waller and Mike Kosicki. Mike Kosicki is not a lock to play by any means. He has a chance to play, supposedly, but he is not a guarantee. If he does play, he's going to be inside my top 12 because we've seen him um, with Tua start to develop some kind of rapport, and he was coming off that huge game in which he got injured. So if, if Kosicki plays, he's inside my top 12, and I think you can use him. Darren Waller, uh, on the other side of things, has a tougher matchup uh, with the t- uh, Miami Dolphins defense, but his target volume is as sure a bet as any at the tight end position, and there's absolutely no way you can sit him. So uh, obviously, you know, if Darren Waller is um, in the lineup, pretty much he's in your fantasy lineup. To the 1 p.m. games on Sunday, we have the Indianapolis Colts and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Quarterback position in this game, you sit both quarterbacks. Both quarterbacks are immobile, washed-up guys. That's that's really all it comes down to. They are not to sniff your fantasy lineup under any circumstances this week. Rivers is in a prime uh, was in a prime matchup last week, and he did exactly what I said he would. I said he's going to score under 20 fantasy points because Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines have the better matchup, and that's exactly what happened. Big Ben just, I mean, he just played like hot diggity dog shit fresh off a game where he made the Bengals defense look like an elite unit. The Colts, uh, while maybe not an elite unit, are a great unit, and they're definitely better than uh, the Bengals defense. And the Steelers passing game will will likely struggle again. So I'm not really willing to start either of these quarterbacks under any circumstances. I would rather risk it with a guy like Tuo, like Teddy Bridgewater even, just someone that gives me even something in the rushing game because these guys give you absolutely nothing. And on top of that, they're just not playing all that well. And uh, their offenses kind of lend itself more to the run uh, to the running back position in this game. We have Jonathan Taylor and James Conner. One you start and one you sit. My start of the week is actually Jonathan Taylor. And the reason he's my start of the week is because I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of questions being like, Oh, should I start Jonathan Taylor or Tony Pollard? Do not get cute with Jonathan Taylor. That's all I got to say about it. He is posting Season highs in usage. He doubled up Naheem Hines last week in routes run, and he out-targeted him 5-3 to three on top of seeing a season high in snaps and dominating goal line work. I know Pittsburgh is a bad matchup, and they still have been a bad matchup as of recently, even though they have fallen off a little bit since uh, Bud Dupree and Devin Bush and a couple of their other starters have gotten injured. But Jonathan Taylor is not to leave your lineup under any circumstances, no matter what the matchup is, because he is just getting way too much volume. And... I think you'll, you'll be kicking yourself if you sat Jonathan Taylor for Tony Pollard or someone and they didn't get the work because you know Jonathan Taylor, regardless of the matchup, is going to get volume. And the Steelers defense, while not a good matchup, has been a little bit weaker since those injuries, as I mentioned. To the uh, others running back in this game, a guy that, uh, unlike Jonathan Taylor, should never enter your lineup, and that's James Conner. He was a late inactive against Cincinnati. And thankfully, for those of you maybe that had Benny Snell and James Conner on your roster, um, he was a late inactive because if you were counting on James Conner, you were probably pretty concerned. And if he plays in this game against Indianapolis, I'm sitting him. There's no chance in hell that I would be playing him in this game. If Benny Snell is alone in this backfield again, if James Conner is out, then I'm willing to low end flex Benny Snell because I think Benny Snell is the better running back. I think he's, I can't believe I'm ever going to say this about Benny Snell compared to someone, but he's the more explosive running back. And he's shown a good, um, a good job getting into the end zone on the goal line. So Benny Snell, if he's alone in this backfield, is a high-end RB3, low-end RB2 type, maybe running back 26 to 24 range. So he is just on that borderline of a starter. And I think you can use him, especially if you lost someone like Clyde edwards helaire like myself, or if you don't have Ronald Jones this week, or maybe you're counting on Wayne Gallman and he's been crap in the bed the, the past couple of weeks. I think you can use Benny Snell in that uh, situation. But James Conner, if he plays, is out of my lineup. I'm not starting him under any circumstances. Uh, to the wide receiver position in this game. We have Deontay Johnson, who is a start. Juju Smith-Schuster and Chase Claypool and T.Y. Hilton, all of them are kind of low-end flex plays, in my opinion. Deontay Johnson is so significantly higher than the other four receiver options in this game, in my opinion, because in games where Deontay Johnson has not left early with concussions or whatever other injuries he had earlier in the season, he has had double-digit targets in nine of the 11 games. Guys like Stephon Diggs, Keenan Allen, are, are those are the type of dudes that see that kind of volume. I have absolutely no qualms starting Deontay Johnson in this game. But his teammates, however, are a different story. Juju is the focus of attention right now because of his antics or whatever he's doing at midfield. Um, and I think he is he's starting to fall off in terms of what his role is, his trust with Ben Roethlisberger. And on top of that, this offense is not one that is going to produce three viable fantasy receivers like we thought it could earlier in the season because Ben is not playing well. I don't know what it is. Maybe he's, he's over the hill. Maybe his arm is shot. Who the hell knows? But either way, 
Juju is not a guy that you can trust openly. I think you can put him in your flex spot if you need to, but I'm not overly excited about that in this matchup. He's going to see Kenny Moore um, in the slot, who's been quite good. Chase Claypool is set to see Rocky Sin, who's potentially not even a starter anymore. It could be uh, TJ Carey on the outside. And Chase Claypool is a guy that has been seeing inconsistent playing time. Both these dudes are back-end wide receiver threes to me as they kind of present some kind of risk. But I suppose both are startable if you need them. Um, T.Y. Hilton, on the other hand, came down to earth as my gut kind of told me he would, uh, subtle brag, but I think he's around that range um, with these tertiary Steelers wide receivers. I think I'd rather play T.Y. Hilton than both of these guys, just someone that you need to weigh their outcomes because Hilton, much like Chase Claypool, could have a great game where he sees um, a lot of volume and maybe a big play or two, but he could also have a game where he sees very low volume, which he did last week. So neither, none of these guys are safe outside of De- Deontay Johnson is basically the point of this. Um, and T.Y. Hilton is expected to see Joe Hayden in coverage. I mean, I'm not exactly sure how good Joe Hayden has been playing. Maybe a Steelers fan can tell me. I think he's still good enough to stop someone like T.Y. Hilton, though. So I, I, I think T.Y. Hilton is a guy I have about wide receiver 28-ish. And then Juju and Claypool I have just outside of wide receiver 30-ish range. So um, none of these guys are overly exciting outside of Deontay. Uh, to the tight end position in this game, we have no tight ends in this game, likely. Um, because we saw Eric Ebron go out with a back injury on uh, Monday Night Football. As I mentioned, that basically lost me a matchup, unfortunately. I just needed four points from him uh, on Monday night to win. And unfortunately that didn't happen. I'm not going to go yell at him on like on Twitter, like some people might do. Um, and for those of you that consider doing that or have done that, you probably shouldn't be doing that anymore. Cause that's the reason that guys like Josh Jacobs are trolling fantasy owners. Cause they're sick of stuff like that. Either way, Eric Ebron probably out for this game. And then you cannot start uh, a tight end on the Colts. So don't worry about the tight end position from this game. Unless Eric Ebron plays, then it's maybe a different story. All right, next game we have here is the Falcons at the Chiefs. As I mentioned, this is going to be one of the higher paced games of the week, and I am personally taking the over in this game. Quarterback-wise, we have low-end stream Matt Ryan, and then we all know to start Patrick Mahomes if he even has one leg out there. Matt Ryan got to play a defense last week that was prone to quarterbacks. The Buccaneers' defense, as I mentioned, has been prone to fantasy production from quarterbacks and receivers. And this week, should, he should be functional if you need him uh, to be, but much like Tua, I'd rather start a guy like Baker Mayfield or the other options I listed, unless Julio is back. Then Matt Ryan becomes a top 15 option, but I'm not willing to start uh, Matt Ryan in a situation where I have maybe some better options like Baker Mayfield or, or someone like that, Mitch Trubisky even. Running back wise in this game, we have the Falcons running backs. You sit them all. And Le'Veon Bell, I think you can be like kind of like a low end flex for you. Not a lot to like from a running back perspective in this game, to be honest. But for the Falcons, Todd Gurley is a complete non-factor at this point and likely will be relegated to an even even less of a role as uh, coach interim coach Raheem Morris claiming that Ido Smith is the starting running back now. Just I would just avoid this backfield altogether and hope to God that they draft someone next year because. Uh, this offense should be clearly yielding a pretty decent running back. They have the opportunities there for it, but they just don't have any good running backs on the roster. They need to inject some talent to that position. And for dynasty purposes, this is a prime landing spot for a guy like Najee Harris or like a, a different running back like that. The Chiefs backfield should be at least clear to us with CEH likely out for a month or so. Le'Veon Bell should see the majority of work. I don't expect him to be all that effective with that work because this is a bad matchup against the Falcons. They've been pretty good against the uh, opposing running backs, but He should be involved enough on the goal line in the receiving game and on the ground that he's a back-end RB2 who's probably a touchdown or bust uh, type of guy in a tough matchup unless he just sees some ungodly amount of receiving volume for some reason. Um, But Le'Veon Bell is a guy that I would trust, I think, um, as like, I think he's like RB23 in my ranking. So he is definitely a startable option. If you lost a guy like CEH, maybe you were stashing Le'Veon Bell in case that did happen. Unfortunately for me, who had CEH, I did not have Le'Veon Bell on my roster, so I have to pivot to other options. To the wide receiver position in this game, Calvin Ridley and Tyreek Hill. Those are your starters and Julio if he plays, but Russell Gage and all those other like tertiary options, Sammy Watkins, McCole Hardman, none of these guys enter your lineup. Ridley is an auto start no matter what, no, like no matter what, no matter if Julio is back or not. This matchup figures to be tougher than the one that they had uh, last week against uh, Tampa Bay Bucks, including even with the Carlton Davis shadow, because as I mentioned, Calvin Ridley, when he was not on Carlton Davis, had some pretty bad corners on him. The Chiefs rank 26th, on the season and 30th over the last five games against wide receivers. So they have been a top 10 defense against wide receivers over the course of the entire season. And they've been borderline elite against them these past five games. And this is despite playing some good offenses too. They played the Bucks offense. They played 
Um, they played the Saints offense with no Michael Thomas, obviously, but like either way, they've played some good teams. It's not like they've been playing bad teams. Ridley should see enough to mitigate this kind of bad matchup in terms of his volume, but his efficiencies may struggle in this game. I don't anticipate him having like a hundred yard game like he did last week. Um, especially if uh, Julio Jones is back for this one, there's a chance that both of those guys um, see a bit uh, less of a efficiency bump. As of now, we don't actually have any conf- concrete information regarding Julio's condition, but I'd guess he's out again. If I was a betting man to put some money down, I would say Calvin Ridley is probably going to be alone in this uh, in this receiving core again. I don't think Julio Jones is likely to play. Uh, Calvin Ridley is expected to see Charvarius Ward in coverage. Shouldn't be uh, too much of an issue for him. But again, as I mentioned, the, the defense as a, as a whole is just not all that favorable to wide receivers. And it's a little bit shocking that they aren't because they generally speaking get ahead of teams very often and force teams to throw the ball. Uh, to the uh, Chiefs side of things, we have Tyreek Hill, only startable receiver in this matchup. Tyreek, the touchdown machine. Basically, he's leading the league in touchdowns. Should have a great performance. In this game, matched up against Isaiah Oliver, good for one of the biggest advantages on the week. Demarcus Robinson, Sammy Watkins, McCole Hardman. Sure, one of these guys could go off. Who is it? Who the hell knows? So only DFS purposes for those guys. Don't um, mess around with those guys in your championship lineup. Uh, To the tight end position, pretty simple here. We start Travis Kelsey, as we always do, and we sit Hayden Hurst. Travis Kelsey is tight end one for the fifth consecutive year for, uh, for him. That's just absolutely incredible and probably is likely not to be repeated anytime soon. Maybe George Kittle can do that in the future if he, um, if he learns how to stay healthy, but just absolutely remarkable play from Travis Kelsey this year. You were definitely glad that you drafted him in the back of the second round or whatever you ended up getting him. Hayden Hurst, on the other hand, has an okay matchup. Uh, the Chiefs have been a little bit more susceptible to tight ends. As I mentioned, they've been tougher on receivers, um, but he's been inconsistent to start. He's been too inconsistent to start this year, and you should have better options than Hayden Hurst. And then finally here, we have the Bears at the Jaguars. Quarterback-wise in this game, you stream Mitchell Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, Trubisky has shown to be a solid streamer, and this week should be no different. Of course, there's always the risk that David Montgomery siphons all the touchdowns in this game and that Trubisky disappoints from that perspective, but he should definitely be in play for you into your lineups. From the Jaguars side of things, as far as their quarterback position is concerned, we don't even know who's going to be starting the game. They haven't really come out and said Gardner Minshew's starting or Gardner Minshew's not starting. So I'm going to assume it's Gardner Minshew for now, but I honestly have no idea. Um, I'm not really sure how many Jaguars are starting, especially I'll tr- uh, transition into it. James Robinson is a big question mark for this game. So if he doesn't play, how many Jaguars are people actually starting? Uh, he's currently dealing with a high ankle sprain. And we've seen from guys like Christian McCaffrey this year and Michael Thomas this year and Alvin Kamara last year and uh, Saquon Barkley last year, that these are not easy to play through, nor are they easy to come back from in general. The Jags are out of it, obviously. They have the first overall pick uh, right now, and they'd be wise to shut down their rookie running back right now. And if Robinson is out, I would sit everyone from this backfield, including Dario Goombawale and uh, Divina Zigbo. Just don't mess around with these guys in your championships. Uh, Montgomery, on the other hand, we know what we're getting out of him. He is playing like an absolute league winner right now, averaging over 25 points per game in the fantasy playoffs. Unfortunately for me, in the two finals I made this year, I play against Montgomery in both leagues, which is not great. And the Jags are giving up 26.9 fantasy points per game to running backs these last five games, which is number one in the NFL. So if you have David Montgomery, congrats on your championship because he's probably going to have a 30-point game. Uh, To the wide receiver position, we have Allen Robinson and uh, DJ Chark. I think you are obviously starting Allen Robinson. Allen Robinson is expected to see Greg Maven in coverage, to be honest, it really doesn't matter who's on him uh, this week because the Jags are missing their three starting corners again. And all of these guys can, uh, their starting corners that they're missing were already bad. So the guys that are replacing them are even worse than them. Allen Robinson is probably going to go nuts in this game. And congrats if you have uh, him as well, because he'll probably do super well for you. If you have Allen Robinson and David Montgomery on your team, maybe you're a diehard Bears fan or something. uh, They're probably going to do super well and help get you to a championship. DJ Chark, on the other hand, he's so inconsistent. I'd highly recommend not starting him, but he's capable of dropping numbers in this game. He is set to see uh, a number of just, just bad corners with Kyle Fuller expected to be on LaVisca Chenault. There's a chance that DJ Chark has a big play in this one and, and can help um, contribute to your uh, to your fantasy roster and for your fantasy championship this week. So, I mean, DJ Chark, I might be forced to start him if, uh, if Tony Pollard is not the starting running back, but... Uh, I think there's a good chance he actually has a decent game in this one. So I, I wouldn't mess around and start him over better options. But if you're caught between DJ Chark and Chase Claypool, I don't hate playing DJ Chark. 
And finally, we have the tight ends in this game. We have Cole Clement, who has been has been an interesting name. He's going to be much more interesting next year than he has been this year, especially considering he actually played 100% of the snaps last week, which I don't even think I've seen any tight end do, including Travis Kelsey. So I would hope you have better options this week, but if you have to start Cole Clement, I don't hate it, I guess, but just play, uh, it's a good matchup. So there's a good chance that he could be decent in this game, but I'm probably not ballsy enough to be starting a guy like Cole Clement. All right. As I said, this is the end of uh, of this kind of slate of games. I'm going to go through the remaining games tomorrow, uh, being Thursday. I'll try and get all of these out before the Friday games commence because I don't really want to be putting out content or recording content on Christmas Day, and you guys probably won't be watching very much content on Christmas Day. So uh, up on the uh, on the docket, we have the Bengals, Texans, Giants, Ravens, Browns, Jets, and then all the 4 p.m. games and the primetime games uh, tomorrow. So make sure you guys are stay tuned for that. Like this video if you enjoyed. Comment any of your thoughts down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Peace out, guys, and I'll see you guys next time.